The following is an original audio series from Sierra International Machinery, Pile of Scrap, with your host, John Sacco. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Pile of Scrap. Boy, as soon as I say it, all of a sudden all the noise comes on. There you got beep beeps, and we got everything going on over here. All right, well, listen, I'm here today uh, with, I'm here in Jessup, Georgia, in our new factory, our new building, and um, I'm here with Emery Olds. Hello, Emery. Hello, good to be here. Randy Hanson. Handsome Randy Hanson. <laughs> so handsome, you have to say it twice, right? That's right. Yeah, and, and Emery's Italian nickname is Emerucho's Mobility, just so <laughs> we get it all out of the way what uh, <laughs> our Italian nicknames are for these guys. But anyway... Today, gentlemen, you know, people who listen to our podcast have learned a lot of things. And I think I want to focus today on operations. You know, we, we sell balers, we manufacture balers and conveyors. And I think it's educational for people some do's and don'ts before they buy a machine and when they buy a machine when they're designing. And I think we want to talk a little bit about that and a little bit of things about what makes balers work and in and, and different formats. Emery. You are general manager here at uh, Jessup, our factory, and you've been doing this for a long time. Tell us a little bit about your history in the baler industry and, and how long you've been doing this. Well, I started in the baler industry in 1990. I worked for a few of our competitors. 30 years? Uh, yes. All right. So you worked for a few of our competitors? I have. Don't necessarily have to mention any names. No, we don't do that. We don't have to do that. But you, with your experience with de- designing balers, um, you designed a lot of different things. So tell us a little bit about where you started in design from hydraulics to structural and go from there. Well, um, in design of recycling equipment, uh, basically I guess I started with conveyors. Uh, worked through a couple of uh, conveyor designs for some of our competitors. Uh, moved up from there into the baler world. Uh, got my feet wet with a few um, narrow box balers, uh, some lidded balers, and then uh, from there into some uh, bell tie balers. So they were doing both baling and tying, and uh, then moved from there into some. Uh, very large wide mouth auto ties. So uh, in the Sierra world, you know, <laughs> uh, things changed a little bit and uh, uh, we carried from there into uh, a very large wide mouth two rim baler. So it's 30 years of ba- baler and conveyor experience. Randy Hansen, tell us a little bit about your background in this industry. Baylor conveyors and your technical background a little bit. I started in uh, 1988. Uh, actually started in uh, shipping and receiving, uh, not realizing then how much that would actually benefit me later on uh, the shipping part because I was putting my hands on parts all the time, shipping parts. I began to understand, you know, what went where on a machine. Uh, shortly after that, moved into uh, electrical department, and then uh, wired machine, tested machines, and then moved into the uh, service department in the beginning of 1989. So from then on, I kind of, for whatever reason, seemed to gravitate towards the two rams, and I've uh, pretty much stayed with that product line. So you, you are the head, Emory, you're a general manager. You run this facility, the whole aspect. Randy, you're the head technician at Sierra for two ram balers. So when when we can't fix it, they call on you, you're the you're the specialist, right? <laughs> Dr. Hansen's like some of them like to call you, right? That's great. Well you got a lot of a lot of experience. So Emory, you've developed you you're very modest, but you, you you hold some patents. How many patents have you do you hold? I believe I have five in my name. And since you've been with Sierra, we, there's two, right? There is two. How about you? You got any patents? 
Uh, not necessarily patents, but uh, a lot of times after the idea is floated, I'm usually sitting in the meetings, we trying to hammer ideas out and how we think this might work in our industry. Well, I know because we, we, we all have conversations how to do things, and it, it's funny. One day we're in Bakersfield and we're talking about how can we make a baler faster? How can we make it faster? And then Randy comes into the meeting and says, Oh, I know this conversation. How are we going to weld? wings to a bullfrog. Other, in other words, we can't go faster. <laughs> Somebody talk about the speed. What, what is it about speed and its limitations as we are with technology today? Any one of you. Now, well, let's all not let's jump see, in well, there at the same time. Well, well we, we've uh, <laughs> you pretty much reached, reached the uh, maximum velocity that, that seals in the cylinder. Uh, you start to move the cylinders any faster than what we're moving them now, and um, you get into a, an effect that'll literally melt the seal and create uh, cylinder damage. So, you know, it, it's interesting because in the oil drilling business, a friend of mine who's in it, you can, drilling deep, you get high temperatures and they, they eat up a lot of drill bits. You know, you can go deeper, but you're just going to eat up the equipment. And so it's trying to make it cooler. So right now, cooling isn't an issue. You can't cool it because there's just too much friction for speed, right? So we're at the max. So this is what I want to segue from that. So we're at the max speed, any baler, you know, what we've designed. But that led us into your newest patent on our Rev4, the dual right. compression. Right. And the thought wasn't, we're not going to move faster, we're going to do... More volume. More volume. Describe that. So tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Well, uh, we, we took the same um, bailing dimensions, basically, of our standard piece of equipment, and we put devices on it that would let us pre-compress the material. So basically, that was giving us twice the charge uh, as normal. And so, so a normal charge, when people understand, when material falls into the charging chamber of a baler, what percentage of that chamber is being used on a normal basis, on a regular two ram versus you, your... You know, it, de it depends on the material, but it's never 100%. Baler, baler is never 100%. Uh, you know, if you've got a real loose material like plastic, you're going to lose 40%. So you're uh, getting Maybe paper or cardboard, you may push out 10 or 20%. So uh, your efficiency... Uh, goes away with that material uh, leaking out or pushing out of the chamber as Roll the ram back. is going forward. Right, rollback. So that's that. That's created the Rev Four, and now with the Rev Four that has the dual compression doors that keeps more material. How much more percentage material are we actually getting in that charge, comparative to let's say our Rev Two that doesn't have that feature? Um, One hundred to seventy-five percent. So. Henceforth, what used to take 15 strokes now takes seven strokes because you're doubling. Right. See, that's the that's what I like to do. That's what, what's really unique. Somebody asked me at a convention. Now I was there uh, at Waste Expo. Well, what makes your baler so much better? And one of our sales uh, representatives started talking about baler features, and I stopped him about after 10 seconds. I said, "No, that's not what makes Sierra better. Our experience." as a processor, our experience in who designs, our experience in who diagnoses and services machines, our, you know, our experience in actually building these machines is what sets us, you know, makes it different. You guys combine, how many, do you, you're, you're 32 years. You're 30, yep. And you guys, you know, combine, and then with Jeff, and how many years he's been, you know, we almost have 100 years just between the three of you an actual baler fabricating, assembly testing, and service work. So I think that, um, you know, that's what keeps us innovative. And I love the fact that you have patents and we keep, you know, what, what can we do? And we always have that discussion, what can we do? What can we do better? And, you know, speaking of what you can do better, I find that in this industry, sometimes people designing these systems where balers go into or conveyors go in, they need to do better because they make mm -hmm. some common mistakes. Randy, in, in your experience, what's the biggest mistake you see 
that you've seen in design of, of systems, be it MERS, be it just individual operation? What, what's the biggest mistake you see? Uh, I think probably the biggest thing is area for storing the loose material before it goes to the baler. Uh, a lot of times, uh, and uh, you call them bins or hoppers or just storage area, but uh, most of the time it's, it's, uh, it's just simply underestimated what they might need for a specific material. And what that does to them is that means they have to do a material changeover or a grade changeover. And so in a, in a MRF application, you have to finish the material you're bailing and to start the next one, you can't mix a lot of the product. Um, and that changeover time in that, what that creates is a longer changeover time. Um, and sometimes I've seen it run, you know, 10 to 15 minutes uh, per material. And then they do that 12 to 15 times a day. So, you know, they're losing there's a, couple, there's two there's and a half to three hours worth of bailing time just swapping the product back and forth. You know, and, and, and I'm not saying we know everything, but I think people who listen to this podcast and talking about recycling and talking about design in, in these systems that people have to be cognitive of what you said. You have to have a conscious about how much material you're going to have on your tipping floor that goes onto these conveyors because every space is a premium, right? It is. Even here, we had to build this new $4 million facility because we were out of space in our 48,000 square foot building. So we have to, you know, space is always a premium and people I think need to, to, to see that. What about you, Emery? What have you witnessed? What have you seen a, a mistakes uh, people make when they're put systems in with, to have our baler or any baler and come out over the years? You know, well, this isn't just Sierra. This is when your experience. Usually the least amount of thought is put into the baler. Everybody's concentrating on the material coming in and how they're gonna process it through uh, separation uh, and they leave a small square in the corner and expect to get a baler in it. No room for maintenance. Uh, bells are ejecting in the way of the traffic of transportation in the building. Uh, coolers so close to the wall they can't do their job and cool. Yeah, they can't get the airflow that they need, right. to, especially in hot climates and there's plenty of hot climates where these MRFs and systems are going yeah. into. But the baler seems to be a second thought instead of a first thought in a lot of these facilities. Uh, and, it, and it may be that when they're designing the facility, they don't know whose baler is going to be there. So, I mean, catch 22. So I think those, those who are listening need to understand, hey, you may have somebody designing your system, but be proactive in the design of the baler that's going in there, that you're, you're designing this that the baler has enough room for the material to get to the infeed conveyor and they can maintain the baler because i always say if you can't maintain it, if you can't get to it you won't maintain it and that'll be that'll be a problem you know at sierra again we we pra we process 70 something thousand tons of recyclables a year from scrap iron to paper non-ferrous material so we have a lot of experience but i get asked that question a lot in scrap metal operations hey what do you think about the design and the layout but we don't get invited to that table very much into the fiber, into the waste sector. And I think that's, that people need to hear this and understand, hey, bring us into this conversation earlier and I think we can eliminate and create more efficiencies for them down the road. I mean, you know, that's just a personal vote. What about things, uh, we got to ask the question today. We had customers here and they asked, what are, what are the failures that you see during installation? You came up with some pretty good, what are, what are some of these failures? Well, uh, preparation of the site for the equipment that's going to be unloaded. You know, sometimes it seems to be, even though uh, uh, the whole process is uh, stepped out one, two, three, it always seems to be a surprise maybe some to some customers when the equipment shows up, the area the equipment's going to be put in, there's either a baler still there or the site hasn't been cleaned up and ready, uh, power's not available, hydraulic oil is not available, wire for the wire tire is not available. Uh, well, I th and I think that the conversations we have with customers is trying to prevent that but we seem to run into it all the time. Well, we don't have our power. Well, 
how, why did you make us deliver it? So I think people have to understand that's that's costing people a lot of money to have our installation team to have to come back to complete installation because they don't have power. What about conveyor issues? What have you seen with conveyor and design when we don't get to do the conveyor? What have you seen in conveyors that hinder operations, Randy? Uh, yeah, not uh, just because you have the ability to run a conveyor at a at a higher speed um, doesn't necessarily equate into better throughput to a machine. Uh, sometimes they'll go with a 60 inch and say, well, I'll just run it twice as fast. Well, if the material can't go up the belt, it doesn't matter how fast the conveyor runs. So I see undersizing a lot of times, uh, you know, and I understand this is their money and it costs money, but a lot of times it ends up costing you while your baler's operating too. So. Well, I had a customer who one day he bought a, a, a Reb from us, Reb One. And I said, well, you need the conveyor. He goes, oh, don't need the conveyor. I go, well, you're going to lose a lot of production. And I, I don't know, four or five weeks after the install, I got the phone call. You're right, I need the conveyor. Because, you know, without a conveyor, the, people think they can direct load, but really what percentage less production are they going to get without a conveyor? Let's say in a non-ferrous application. Let's go with, let's go in a non-ferrous application. 50%? Yeah, I'd say at least 50% right off the bat that's a lot of that's a lot of production it is and i think you know but maybe some you know the budgets are important but if you can afford it you put the conveyor in don't you think Definitely. all right so when you go to these murfs and you guys have been around and you've seen these things europe no murf no conveyor and non-ferrous no paper is loaded with front end loaders it's all material handlers. In America, it's all front end loader. What's your opinion about that? They, you know, I, I like the material handler because it's, I mean, it's basically like your hand in your arm. Uh, I think you want one, it gives you, gives the operator more reach without having to move the equipment. Because as Emory mentioned before, there's constantly forklifts running around either, you know, picking up bales or, or taking bins that are or uh, collecting overflow, you know, or something like that. So it allows you to set the machine up and have a greater radius for reach around to you. And uh, I just think it's a little better in loading the the uh, in-feed belt because uh, you can do a better job of distributing the material on the belt versus having a, yeah, a great big bucket's nice, but you're dumping all that product, you know. Clumps. Down. Yeah, exactly. Clumps don't don't separate well and I think even burden depth on my opinion is is yeah. is a much better thing what about you what's your what's your thoughts front end loader versus material handler what what do you like one versus the other well I like the aspect of the handler because you can reach in with fingers pull out items that you don't want to bail uh -huh. you don't have anybody stepping on the belt or stopping everything because you got a foreign piece of material and what you're bailing well, I like it too. It's a safety thing. You know, front end loaders can move a large volume, but they're pushing. And if you don't see what's on the other side, if somebody's done, they could get pushed and covered on a big pile of waste, paper, scrap metal, it doesn't matter, mm -hmm. whatever they're pushing, and you'll never see that guy. I got a video, I have a video of that happening. And uh, it, it's just it's sad. Pretty. No, it, you know, so I think safety, you know, at Sierra, we have that saying, you know, safely or not at all. And as much safety as we try to build in, we try, but we can't always, we're not the guys operating it. And we try to give our advice, you know, look, not only have you guys been doing this a combined 60 years, Sierra Recycling and Demolition has been doing recycling for 60 years. So it's not like, we're rookies at this. It's not like, you know, but we're not, we're not also, you know, it's not gospel what we say, but we, I think our experience tends to lead to, to probably a little more efficiency and a lot more safety. Uh, well, that's the way I look at it. I, I don't know. So where is the, the, the craziest place in the world you've done an install? Oh, wow. Well, um, I'd have to say probably in a little town called Gangstow, Norway. Um, 
it wasn't the middle of nowhere, but there was a sign that said turn left and you'd find the middle of nowhere because it was, <laughs> I mean, it was way out. Uh, so I'd have to say that that was pretty interesting, pretty interesting install. Was it in winter or summer? When uh, were you there? I was in the dead of winter, unfortunately. How cold so, was that? Oh, gosh. It was in the negatives every day <laughs> when we were there. So it's was, it was pretty rough. Pretty what rough. about you, Emery? For a baler or just any piece of equipment? Well, let's stick with balers and conveyors for our industry. Uh, probably New Jersey. We had a, <laughs> a, brand, a brand new startup on a prototype machine, one of the patents. Uh, it was the dead of winter. Uh, in an open-sided building, and uh, it was snowing sideways. <laughs> was was very, it was a very cold yeah. week. But Randy, you said Randy boys down here don't Randy, get too much. Randy, <laughs> actually, Randy was, Randy was there with me. Ah. And it was very rough. We had a torpedo heater <laughs> that we just lived by for 10 days. I mean, oh, I know was, that. I, I, you know, I did one. I've, I've said it before in this pile, but I've done an uh, install with Antonio in minus 48 degree with wind, wind chill was minus 48. Yep. It was minus 18, but with the wind, it was minus 48 degrees. And uh, that was, uh, well, it's, I'm just glad I don't do installs anymore. <laughs> I'm out of that business. Oh, well, Shorty once told me, he goes, John, he goes, look, just sell them. We'll figure out how to install. <laughs> I think that meant, John, you're in the way, get out of the way. But you know, hey, it, it, it's what we do. It's our experience. So here we are, we're in our new building. Tell us a little bit about Emory, what we've changed here in Jessup in the last year with this new building and the stuff we've added to become more efficient and a little bit better. Oh, um, well, obviously the new building we're in here is a 24,000 feet expansion. Uh, it's allowed us to get the inventory out of our production building and uh, give us that room for extra production area. We've added a paint booth. It's a uh, uh, heated paint booth, so we can cure our paint jobs, uh, get things in and out, cut down on the bottleneck we have on our current paint booth. We have added a five axis uh, plasma cutting machine so that we're processing our own plate and uh, beveling it as we cut it. And are you seeing the efficiencies now? I mean, we just finished this, you know, really August, September, really. Are, are we starting to see the efficiencies now? You know, I, I am seeing it. I, you know, I can't add an, an exact percentage to it now, but it just seems monthly to get better. I mean, I mean it, it's that obvious. Okay. What about for you, Randy? What do you see with all this? Uh, you know, the, I think the burn table and all, you know, the process in house, the distribution. I actually mentioned to him about a month ago that things are coming through the shop quicker. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, what I like about it is something like that. You know, we have the cut and do all the drawings here, send it to the burn table. So we, we're controlling the whole aspect of it now instead of relying on someone else to do that for us and it's it's i've seen a, i've seen a huge increase why does this new building already seem too small too small <laughs> we need to add to it <laughs> but we you know the great thing is is over here on this wall we we can expand this building another uh 60 feet yeah. to the north it's it's already designed in there but to me it's already like we might need to do that but Little steps at a time. We've spent some good money here, but I, you know, I see it. it it's fun. I love coming here to Georgia. I, I, I love, you know, I think the people are great. I, there's a great spirit here, and, and I think we have a team that we've developed here over the years that really gets what it is we're trying to do. And, you know, that's the Sierra way, you know, from look, in all of Sierra, you know, we do so many different things outside of just building equipment and selling equipment and providing I mean, we do oil filled service work. We do actual scrap metal processing, ferrous, non-ferrous, you know, coppers, aluminum, stainlesses. We process paper. So, you know, we're very versatile in what we do, but I always enjoy coming back here to the factory. It's needs to happen. I've been here quite a bit here in the last last six yeah, months. You have been. I've been here uh, three times, three times, and I don't usually get here, you know, every two months. That's true. So, but I, I, I enjoy coming over here. I, 
Um, we're going to need new off more offices, not new offices. We need more offices, office. don't we? We do. Does it ever stop? No, it sure had <laughs> Well, I think that's that's the, that's the beauty of what we're doing. So, look, I appreciate your guys' time. I just wanted people that see this podcast to know, look, I think when you engage with Sierra and you engage in the process of, of buying a baler conveyor for your systems, for recycling systems, engage us early. I think we can help people in their design. And I think we're not engineers in design layout, but we have so much common sense experience. And I think that's what people need to know. That there's a lot of experience just sitting here between the three of us. I grew up, you know, first piece of equipment I ever operated was a broom, right? So I know what it is. I've run shears, I've run balers. You guys have built balers, design balers, conveyors, and everything like that. So I think calling us a little bit, we can help. And it really is a conversation more than it is anything else. I just think sometimes communication with customers is important. What do you think? I agree. It is. It's yes, number one, without a doubt. Well, I think that's what it is. So anyway, gentlemen, I appreciate it. How long before we put the expansion on here? Guess. Um, six months. Really? Ooh. <laughs> what do you think, Randy? I, I was going to say 18 months. 18 months. Well. <laughs> I was thinking a year, so maybe we split <laughs> meet in the middle. <laughs> we meet in the middle, but you know what? We, we, we're blessed with having a, a, a great product that you guys have developed, that you guys build and, and service. Um, the marketplace has taken to it, and I think our growth, we see the growth into these other industries that we are, are happy to have, and uh, hey, let's hope we get to expand. That means good, more jobs. You know, we got a lot of people working in this plant. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and can you believe it's been 12 years? It's hard to believe, but it has been. 12 years since we hatched this idea and, and opened up our facility here in Jessup. It doesn't look like 12 years old. I walk around here, it still feels brand new to me. I think that's a testimony to the way you guys keep it. Your housekeeping is, is outstanding, and we invite anybody to come visit us at any yeah, time. Come please. see what we're doing down yeah. here, because I think when they come and they see what it is we're doing, it's more than a sales pitch. It's more than a brochure. You know, they get to interact with people like yourself, Emory, and you, Randy, design and tech and all the different little things that go with it. So, gentlemen, I appreciate your time. Anybody want to say this is another episode of? Go ahead, Emory. <laughs> this is another episode of Pile of Scrap. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> This has been a Sierra International Machinery original audio series. Thanks for listening. Please share this podcast and make sure to subscribe.